Good evening, everybody. I'm just giving a quick heads up. If you can all pull out your phones, which everybody usually has, and head to Cortland Voice and go ahead and share the live feed so that people that might not have been able to make it here tonight can actually get on there. Via Facebook. And it's via Facebook. Okay, get right on Facebook to Cortland Voice. And go ahead and share their live feed, please. Thank you very much. We'll be starting shortly. Also, make sure that you're not walking in front of the camera at any point in time. Thank you. We'll be starting shortly. It goes up and down. Sorry. All right, folks, we are getting ready to go here shortly. Just uh, for people that are on Facebook, 
Um, stick around for us. Don't go anywhere. We are just taking care of a few little details. Thank you. All right, for people that are just showing up again, if you could go ahead via Facebook, go to Cortland Voice. They are kind enough to live feed for us today. So people that weren't able to be here are able to participate. I'm uh, looking out at this crowd, and I want to thank you all for coming. Sorry. <clears throat> so it just breaks my heart, guys, to see such a crowd and so many people that have lost. Um, I'm just glad that I can create a space for us to come that's stigma free and that we are able to have an environment in which we can grieve our loved ones. This epidemic is uh, one that has just taken too many people. Last year at this time, we had 256 pairs of shoes. Each shoe represented a person lost to a drug overdose in the United States. That's 93,440 human beings to drug overdoses in the United States in a 12 month period. Our display over there has 295 signs. Each sign represents a person lost to overdose in the United States a day. That is a staggering. 107,000, over 107,000 human beings in a 12 month period dying when every single overdose is preventable. Before I turn the mic over to our MC tonight, there's a couple things I wanna cover. Um, take note that we have the wonderful and amazing Tracy Northup story over here doing our interpreting. We are asked that you wait to light your candles until we let you know when it's time. We'll do that before the prayer. We do ask that lighters are returned to the table where they came from in the box. You are welcome to keep your candles. There are fire extinguishers by each side over here, and there is one by the table. Let's not need them, but if they do, they're here. And I want to thank everybody that has made this possible. Healing Cortland. Sarah with Cortland Area Community That Cares has been very integral helping. Prevention Network, Southern Tier AIDS Program, Central Region Addiction Resource Center, Cortland Voice for doing our live feed, Healing Hearts Collaborative for helping get all this together, the 607-315 Healing Hearts Parents Grief Group here in Cortland and all the parents help. Selco Industry who has also been an amazing with our banners and signs and the printing. CNY Farm Supply for the trailer usage, allowing to get everything here, which there was a lot. Lowe's Value Home Center and Homer High School helping with the stage because we had to kind of come up with that kind of quick. The Youth Bureau and all their assistance. Carlene Schaefer, all of her help listening while preparation. And with all the can koozies and ribbons that she's put together. Lorraine Burnham, my mother-in-law, for her help with the signs and ribbons. My wife, Maria, for one, tolerating me through this craziness, the late nights, the takeover of the house, for months of preparation to take over the house and all her support. Last but not least, my granddaughter, Logan, for all her help with the button making that everybody should have. If not, make sure you get to the table and get one. And uh, at this time, I'm going to go ahead and turn the mic over to our MC, Astra Parrott, who is a community engagement coordinator for Healing Cortland. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dean. 
Um, I want to first just take a quick moment to appreciate and acknowledge the work that Dean has put into this, um, and in a broader sense, the work that he has done for this community. Uh, you know, he's been supporting naloxone distribution in Cortland since within a month of his son's loss. He's undoubtedly directly or indirectly responsible for probably thousands of Narcan kits since that time. He's vocally advocated throughout the community for action from leaders and accountability when action hasn't come. Dean has pushed for expanding syringe exchange services in Cortland County and now does that work every day as part of staff's mobile unit in addition to the OOPP that he runs. But because Dean cares so deeply about this, he doesn't stop when his workday ends. Um, now, and even before he worked at staff, Dean literally meets people where they are when they need. He makes himself available to the needs of the people he works with. And that's especially evident with this event. All of the things that Dean listed, he has, has done most of that work, um, making the buttons, making the calls, putting together the logistics and organizing speakers. And I just want to take a moment to say thank you. Like he said, my name is Aster. I work with Cortland Area Communities That Care as part of the Healing Cortland Project. It's an effort to improve the lives of people who use drugs in Cortland County and to reduce opioid overdose deaths. We're supported by an NIH-funded research study, but our local team is trying very hard to make sure that whatever comes out of that actually benefits people here in meaningful and sustainable ways. Um, my job is relevant to this event, but I'm also here as a person, not just as staff. Before this job, I helped run the syringe exchange in Ithaca. And before that, I was working on a PhD where I was studying harm reduction, drug policy, and stigma. I studied the institutional regulatory responses to overdose and how stigma shapes these responses. But my experience of overdose, while direct and personal, has also been professional. I have responded to and reversed overdoses, but only at work. Um, intellectually and experientially, I understand some of the very real, concrete ways that stigma around drug use hurts and endangers people. I've seen emergency responders slow down when they see an overdose person that they're approaching is someone that they've rescued in the past. I've seen agency policy that deprioritizes the safety and well-being of clients for fear of theoretically alienating some other, always less precarious, group. The opioid overdose epidemic has so many parts, and I don't only want to save lives, I want to improve them. To do that, we need a lot of tools. One of those tools is naloxone, or Narcan. Another one of those tools is like skills education, how to use that Narcan, how to, you know, dispose of unused opioid drug prescriptions. Another one of those tools is stigma education. And another is policy, like funding housing or physical and mental health care over policing or decriminalizing drugs, or institutionalizing safe supply. None of these social, cultural, institutional, regulatory, or pharmacological tools is going to solve this on its own, though. And I think some of what brings that home for a lot of people is being able to connect to stories. Stories give a face and a name to the statistics and help show the reality of a person or a family to strangers. And that's part of what tonight is for, stories. Making space for stories for people rather than numbers. The numbers are important and rhetorically powerful. I mean, that's, that's part of what makes that display so powerful. But without the stories, they mean less to a lot of people. We've got a great lineup of folks who will be sharing with you this evening their own stories, and I'm grateful to be able to be a part of this. My hope is that through sharing these stories and hearing these stories and names that are spoken later tonight, will be able to let go of some of the shame and internalized stigma and focus on people. So to start out, um, please join me in welcoming Leo Webb, former Binghamton City Council member, lifetime Southern Tier resident, and candidate for the New York State Senate. I want to thank all of the organizers of today's event, uh, most certainly Dean for 
all of your hard work that you do, not just in helping to coordinate today's event, but also the work that you do every day in our community. Um, for folks that are in this type of work, and uh, speaking as a community organizer myself, there are so many stories and people that you come across and what gives you motivation to keep moving forward, especially on issues such as this, is being able to have spaces like what Dean and all of our uh, partner organizations have created tonight. So again, Dean, thank you so very much. Uh, when I was, yes, it is perfectly good and acceptable to applaud and say thank you. And in thinking about what I wanted to offer and share, and I know uh, a number of speakers have started to touch upon this already, when people ask, well, how many folks are being impacted by substance use and overdose? And my answer is very simple, too many. Too many, All right? And whether it's 20 or 20,000, it's too many. And especially in a state such as ours, in a country such as ours, where we have a number of resources, moments like this where we are called to reflect and remember is very powerful. Would y'all not agree? Yes. Because it's moments like this that connect us to each other that center us in each other's respect of humanity. And unfortunately, far too often, the humanity as it pertains to this struggle often gets pushed aside because of the stigmas associated with it and the shame. And so I believe that this requires not only our elected leadership, not only our healthcare practitioners, but all of us as a community to have those difficult and necessary conversations around this important issue. Uh, I don't know if folks are aware, uh, today is actually International Overdose Awareness Day. And I share that simply because for us to understand that this isn't just localized, this is a global issue, right? And so what can we do with knowing this information? It is my hope that in pushing for policies, not only as a former legislator, but also as a community organizer, most importantly, as just a concerned human being, that we have policies that are created that actually help to address this problem, right? And that looks like having universal health care and having equitable resources for mental health services and addressing substance use problems. That looks like providing equitable resources to organizations, including but not limited to the organizations that put together tonight's vigil, but many others, right? Giving them the resources and tools that they need to not only help those who are directly impacted by this issue, but also their families, yes. right? Because that often gets left out in the conversation, right? It's that when you lose someone um, due to over, due to uh, substance use, that hole never gets filled. And so what do you do with that, that pain? And so one of the things that for me, that I often lean to um, is that even in those moments of darkness and despair and grief, that we hold on to and anchor ourselves in the idea and the hope that joy will come in the morning. Is that something y'all can agree with? Yeah. It's that joy of knowing that community is standing alongside with you and helping you to navigate this journey. And so again, I, want, I don't want to take up too much more time, but I just want to let you all know that I am here with you, not as a candidate, not as a community organizer, but as someone who truly is committed to ensuring 
that we are treated and are able to, to live a quality of life from birth with dignity and respect. And that we understand not only the statistics, but the personal stories, because this issue impacts everyone. It doesn't discriminate based off race, ethnicity, right? It doesn't discriminate based off of socioeconomic status or where you live. It impacts everyone and it requires all of us to put all hands on deck to make sure that we address this issue in the most comprehensive and inclusive ways possible. So again, I wanna thank you for allowing me just a short portion of time uh, to be with you all this evening. And again, this is so powerful and I want us to just anchor ourselves in that power of reflection, but also equally important, a commitment to action in the many ways that we can do that. So again, thank you all so, so much. I appreciate all of you. Thank you. Um, I want to just make a quick note. Um, we've had some people arrive late. Um, please feel free to stop by the table here and get a candle and a lighter. Uh, we'll be lighting those later in the event. Um, and just wanna make sure everybody has one so that they can participate as they would like. Um, next, we will be hearing from Ashley Dixon, who is a local community member who has lived, played, and worked around Cortland County for over 30 years. Ashley has been living in recovery since 2015 and has made recovery, prevention, and education the focus of not just their life, but their career as well. I'm very klutzy, and uh, thank you so much. Um, of course, I sent my introduction to Aster before I wrote this. So you're gonna hear a lot of it again. Um, and of course I brought my sunglasses because this is always a little bit emotional to talk about. Um, but I will start at the beginning again. Hi, my name is Ashley Dixon. Uh, I live here in Cortland. I've lived in, worked in, or been involved in Cortland since I moved to New York in 1990. Uh, I have a degree in chemical dependency counseling from Tompkins Cortland Community College. I have a degree in human services from SUNY Cortland. And I, right now I run the collegiate recovery program at TC3. Uh, but I'm not really here to talk about my work. Right? Uh, I'm here to talk about today and why it matters. Um, thank you so much, Leah, for what you said. A lot of it hit home for me very deeply. Uh, when Dean invited me to speak tonight, I was flustered. Uh, I speak professionally for a living, <laughs> so I do it all the time. Uh, but I'm still settling into my identity as a person in recovery, even though it's been seven years since I last used a substance. Uh, I was also deeply honored uh, because I know how important this is. Uh, and seeing all of you in front of me today is overwhelming and beautiful. I sat for a long time trying to figure out what I wanted to say, and to be completely frank with you, I finished writing this about four hours ago. Uh, so there are so many things to say. The message, though, is fairly simple. Hope. Tonight is about holding space for people we've lost and spreading hope and love to people who are still here. If I can give you all one thing tonight, I want it to be hope. I got high for the first time on Main Street, right over there. Uh, I threw up from drinking for the first time on Delaware Ave. I smoked my first cigarette there too. Uh, I hid under a blanket at 2 a.m. in Yaman Park with a group of my friends getting high, smoking weed. I bought my drugs on Groton Ave and Church Street. For the better part of 10 years, I ran from myself. I buried myself in drugs and alcohol so that I didn't have to face the choices I made in the life I was living. I was miserable. Uh, I overdosed for the first time in Ithaca uh, and the second time in Dryden. I was by myself both times and I don't know how or why I survived. I have some ideas now, uh, but it really depends on how much you believe in a higher power. 
I said earlier that I'm a person in recovery. For me, that means that I have not had alcohol or an illegal drug since January of 2015. By the time I started that journey, I didn't have much left in me. I wanted to die and I was actively planning a way to do that, but I'm still here. I'm also uh, struggling with this, excuse me. Sorry, take your time. <laughs> Thank you. There was a moment for me. You could call it a precipice or rock bottom or a turning point or whatever you want. Uh, I don't have a word for it other than it was the moment I realized that I could live. There's only one reason that I was able to do that. I had people. I still have people. There are so many people who care deeply and love and hope and help. And all of you here have been that for someone. Guarantee it. Your experiences and your love and your hope and your pain and the grief that you have and your caring have all made it just a little bit easier and better for someone else to get through. There is grief here tonight, and sometimes that can be an okay thing. There's power in honoring those who are not here with us tonight. Later, we'll be holding space for the names of loved ones that we've lost. I hold those names in my heart every day, and I know you do too. It's what we do with those names and that grief that can make the difference. So tonight, while we're here, and after we go home, and from now on, let's honor those who have passed, and let's lift up those who are here. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that, Ashley. Um, next, we have Amy Sherwood, Joshua's mom. Thank you for coming tonight. I was asked to speak tonight and share about my son Joshua and tell our story. Our story could be like a lot of others, but this particular story started 33 years ago when on January 11th, 1989, a sweet, beautiful boy graced the world with his presence. Joshua is my son and was the most wonderful son a mom and dad could ask for. He was the most caring person. Joshua adored his two sisters, Heather and Emily, his grandparents, aunts, uncles, cousins, and countless friends. Joshua loved singing. He would sing every Disney song as loud as he could. Beauty and the Beast was his absolute favorite Disney movie. And he, he also enjoyed dancing and acting and was in many plays at Portland High School. His first high school role was Charlotte's Web, where he played Wilbur the Pig. Joshua enjoyed being a waiter at Friendly's because he loved talking to people. Joshua was also voted most talkative his senior year, which everyone knows was well-deserved. He also loved working at McDonald's, where he loved everyone he worked with, and when customers came through, he always made them smile. He always found the good in everyone. If you ask any of his friends, he was the sunshine of the group and always had the biggest smile. 
As a teenager, Joshua struggled with depression and anxiety, which, is, which I believe led to his addiction. This continued into his adulthood. He had been in several different short-term rehabs at different times over the years. Finding a rehab that will hold the addict until he or she truly feels healed and ready to re-enter society is very difficult. He fought hard to overcome his addictions and he would often tell his dad and I that he didn't want to use. In April of 2017, Joshua went to a dual rehab. A dual rehab works on both mental health and addiction. It was in Bradford, Pennsylvania, and he was there for 30 days. This was the longest rehabilitation facility that he, facility that he was at. I don't feel 30 days is long enough when it comes to the recovery process. When I went to visit, he seemed optimistic about this one and thought this was the one that, he, that was going to work. He came home on Wednesday, May 10th, and passed away May 15th. My biggest fear in life since I was a child was what if I lost my child. That day, my worst fear came true. I had been trying to reach him, and he would never not respond to me. So I went over to his apartment, and I found him. He was only home five days, five days from being in a place that was helping him. No parent should have to worry each day that they are going to find their child or get that phone call. That day, the world became darker and a bright light was gone. I try to live each day in honor of Joshua and want to help other parents who are going through this. I want them to know they are not alone. I have learned a lot about addiction since losing Joshua. I have learned that Narcan can help someone in early moments of an overdose and that no matter what the drugs are, there is a point when you can take too much. It took me a while to understand that what they found in Joshua's system was things he was prescribed when he left the rehab facility. He just too, took too much, which can happen with any prescriptions. I know that Joshua knew his dad and I did everything we could to get him the help he needed. <clears throat> Everyone knew how much he loved them. He didn't let a day go by without letting someone know how he valued and cared for them. He was a very caring, giving person. Joshua was the person that would give you his last dollar. So to honor him, we are paying it forward and raising money for a scholarship in his name. This is just our story. I encourage all of you to have a conversation with your family and friends, check in on them, make sure they are okay, and know it's okay to talk about addiction and mental health and to seek out help. We need to stop the stigma. I hope that you were one of the lucky ones that got to know Joshua but I was the luckiest one of all to be his mom. I will always love you, Joshua Francis. Thank you. So now we will be lighting the candles as Trevor O'Gorman, Assistant Director at Cortland Bible Camp, uh, joins me up here to lead us in a prayer. Yeah, and if you need a candle or lighter there at the purple table there.
It's my pleasure to be here with you tonight. Thank you for having me. Let's pray. Our gracious Lord and Heavenly Father, we gather here together and ask that you hear our prayer. Our Lord, you see the hurt, the pain, the anger and sadness of your people. We invite you, Lord, to settle here with us. As we come before you with hearts that are broken, full of grief, Lord, we ask that you enter our hearts, repair the brokenness caused by the absence of the ones we lost. We have gathered because we know the pain and the hurt of losing a family member or friend to overdose. We pray, Lord Jesus, that you will heal the hearts. Lord, we will never forget the pain of the loss. It will always be fresh in our hearts. It will always hurt. Lord Jesus, bless these families. Ease the pain, the pain of this indescribable loss as we weep together for the loss of life. Lord, as it says in Joshua 1, 9, be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened. Do not be dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Let us gather strength from you. Let us not be dismayed and rest in your strength. Lord, we raise up those that are struggling with the curse of addiction, struggling with the pain and the fear of overdose. Lord, open the eyes of those with this disease that they may see that they are loved more than they will ever imagine by you and by their families. And if they ask for help, you'll freely give it. In Genesis, Lord, you put us into families. Lord, for the reason, because we need each other. Let us know that they can call out and we will come. We will answer. Lord, we pray for the families of those struggling with this addiction, that you would give them the wisdom, the grace, the endurance during these trying times, Lord. Bless the parents, the spouses, the children, the siblings, the cousins, the friends of those struggling with addiction. Give them love and compassion, Lord. May they never know the pain of this loss. We pray for the city of Cortland and its citizens. We pray that people would be seen as people, sons and daughters of the Lord Jesus, that were carefully crafted and created in the image, in the image of God, that the stigma of drugs and overdose would be no more, that we would love people and show kindness to all. Lord, we pray for the city of Cortland, its administration, its mayor, its aldermen, we pray for the county sheriffs, the county legislators, the state and state police, the state assembly and state senators, the governor. We pray for the federal government and Lord, we pray for your protection for them as they serve in our communities. We pray for wisdom for our lawmakers and law enforcement as they serve and protect, that they would be compassionate and loving to those that they interact with and serve. Lord, we pray for the dealers and manufacturers of these drugs, that, the, that Lord, you would change their hearts, that you would make them feel the depth of the pain that they have caused, that they would be convicted both in their hearts and by our justice system. Lord, lastly and again, we plead with you to heal the hearts of the ones you've left behind. May they, be, may they honor you and the memory of the ones that they have lost to this terrible epidemic. May your grace pour down on these families and the families across the United States. May our everlasting peace and joy, Jesus, ease our pain. We pray in your holy name. Amen.
Dean has asked that I ask Anna Kellis if she'd be able to speak briefly. Thank you. The best kind of speech is the one you're surprised to give, but um, this is one I'm honored to be part of. I'm the New York State Assembly member for Cortland County, but that's not why I'm here today. I'm here with my heart as a human, and I wanted to just acknowledge how beautiful the sight is of seeing every single candle here lit, lit for humanity. And what this vigil means to me is recognizing the humanity of every single person, regardless of all of the hardship and the trauma and the difficulties and the choices of their lives. That is to me the most important part of this for us to hold space and honor the humanity and the pain and the suffering and the beauty of every single person that we have lost due to addiction. And I think that it's so incredibly important that everyone is here today to recognize, to celebrate, and to champion that humanity because there is so much stigma about addiction. But the truth is that anyone who has been affected by it personally recognizes that in so many cases, it is because there is deep emotional processing that is going on, that in so many cases, medication, and I will say medication because so often drugs are used to self-medicate, leads to death. That is what we're facing. And so often, the misinformation that is spread about addiction is to take away someone's humanity. And every single person who's here today is to give back to recognize and to honor the beauty of that humanity. And so in some ways, we're all here in this vigil to hold space, but also to recognize and to take up the banner that we are the champions to demand that we all collectively remember, honor, and fight for the humanity of everyone who is struggling with addiction. Every single person because their humanity needs to be central it needs to be central in our religion it needs to be central in our schools it needs to be central in our healthcare system and I promise you it will be central in my heart in the role that I play in government so I'm here to celebrate that you all are here today and to stand with you and to hold my candle and I will take this in my heart back with me in all the work that I do. So thank you so much for standing here today and being my inspiration and holding this night, remembering that today is honoring every single person that we have lost to addiction. Thank you so much, everyone. Mic is way lower. All right, let's try this again. I'm gonna go ahead and open the mic up. If anybody would like to come up and say their loved one's name. I would just move that mic to there. Daddy Michael's. 
Spencer O'Gorman. Spencer O'Gorman. My son, Spencer O'Gorman. My brother, George Davis. My son, Andy Williams. And my, his friends, Eden Nunn. My dear friend Michael Vance Carabelli. Jacob Glover. My friends Trevor and never stop saying their names, right? Let's keep their names being said. Let's keep it alive. And let's keep the memories going and not give up. We need change and we are going to be the change. All right. Thank you all. Have a great night. Not one more. Not one more.